see you Thank again. You. It's a pleasure. I think Thank we you. last hooked up in uh, in Miami. Yes. yes. Uh, well, now you've you know you've appeared on BET and CNN and C-SPAN and Politically Incorrect and USA Today and Ebony and Source. Has it gone to your head, Jamal? No, that's <laughs> that's why I shaved it all off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, what what is ministry like? Has ministry changed because of notoriety? Because people have uh, come to know who you are as a minister yes. of the gospel? Well, let, let me back up and first say thank you for opening this door. Uh, a lot of people, when they arrive, come down with amnesia. And uh, <laughs> uh, nine years ago, when uh, before I had 12,000 members on the Word Network and BET and all of that, I had about 300 people. I started a church in a nightclub. And uh, you opened the door for me to come to TBN, wow. and the door hasn't shut yet. Wow. And uh, I'm just appreciative <laughs> wow. uh, of you for that. And uh, uh, secondly, you, you don't know what today has uh, meant for me. I uh, preach literally around the world, and many people uh, have uh, been exposed to me by way of uh, TBN. And uh, what most people don't know is uh, Dr. Reed is my father in ministry. This is uh, my very first time sharing with him, and so th this is a real monumental moment for me, and I'm just appreciative of that. Thank well, you. Well, you're very welcome, mm -hmm. and I'm honored that you would mention me in that light. I, uh, I do want you to know, however, that the Lord opened the door for you. Yes. Well, you are and good your, doormen. You and are, your <laughs> gifts have kept the door open. Absolutely. Thank you. But it's an honor. It's, it's a, a strategic time in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, not only uh, because of the time that we're in, but the seasons uh, that are now happening. Uh, just recently, all of America was tuned in to the Oscar Awards. Yes. Uh, and there was a, a critical debate uh, what would happen with the movie The Help. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two different groups. One that was a firm it on uh, another group that felt a different kind of way and at the end of the day uh, it didn't win movie of the year the artist did uh, and it's very significant uh, dr. Clifton mm -hmm. uh, because the movie of the year is silent uh, it's not saying anything uh, and where the church is the church is no longer starring in the help we're now the artists mm. is that we're not saying anything and because we're not saying anything people are not coming to the church because we see a silent picture mm -hmm. of what church was supposed to be like but we're not helping people with foreclosures with unemployment uh, with uh, what they're doing in a souring economy so people are coming to church and seeing the picture of us shouting mm -hmm. the picture of us giving high five but not seeing the picture of us really doing the work of church. Mm. And I think that we're really going to have to recalibrate. Mm. Uh, at the end of uh, the Oscar Awards, a new movie came out uh, by Tyler Perry called Mr. Deeds. I saw it. Uh, and that movie is significant because he had been stuck in a cycle, mm. in a pattern, and in a way of thinking. Uh, but he had to find somebody who was not out of his pedigree, not outside of, outside of his background. And it, that person made him re-examine how am I doing business? Am I doing business because this is what is expected of me? Or is this where my heart is? And I think the church has got to go see that movie mm -hmm. uh, to figure out that this is time for us to break the cycle. Yes. That church as usual is no longer acceptable. Mm -hmm. And one of the critical places... One of the critical places where uh, we marvel uh, at your work, uh, uh, Dr. Davis, is that you have been ambidextrous to work in secular and sacred. Uh, and the culture changes every four years, but church only changes every 20. Mm -hmm. And so the church is usually 15 years behind where it is that we're supposed to be. You know so right. churches are now just getting websites when websites are now going down and people are going to blog pages. Mm -hmm. uh, church pastors are just getting Facebook and people are shifting to Twitter. And so it's important that the church catches up with the time and we set the standard, not respond to what's happening, but shift things so that they begin to happen. Amen. And I think that the real call of effective ministry yes. is not how good the choir sings, how eloquent the preacher pontificates, but what are you doing Monday through Saturday after the benediction? And I think that's what a real effective ministry is. Uh, I think I think you've touched on something profound, and uh, and along the way mentioned what I thought was a, a wonderful film, Good Deeds, that uh, you know was family friendly and uh, um, 
it was a, a, a breakout in terms of a change. Um, but here's the thing. Church as usual mm -hmm. is not going to work right. as usual. Yes. If we would meet the needs of people today, then church has to come up to today. Well, here, here's, the, here's the danger and the challenge, is that so many of us uh, attempt to be current and relevant mm -hmm. uh, without being substantive. Uh -huh. um, uh, Dr. Reed, who was with us just a moment ago, taught me when I was coming up in ministry, make sure you have more substance than style. Uh, and you've got to be at a place that I, when I first started church, I was so intense on getting a new generation into the church, a demographic of 18 to 45. Mm -hmm. We're doing praise and worship songs, and I was adamantly against hymns. Uh, and I realized that hymns is our foundation of theology and doctrine. Mm -hmm. And so I think that while we're being relevant and being contemporary and cutting edge, we can't throw away the stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was really at our very core. And so right. uh, at some point, we got to go back to the old landmark That's and then right. raise the standard up to My another level. My hope is built yes. on nothing less Absolutely. but Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's the red hymnal. I yeah. dare not trust. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're just words. If you know, yes. great is thy faithfulness, yes. O oh God, my Father. Yes. There is no shadow of turning <laughs> with me. When I was in the seminary working on my master, I had a, I had a professor who said, you know, you're learning a lot over here in this uh, school of God, learning about the Lord, but I want you to know something. You better learn you some hymns. Right. <laughs> he said, yeah. learn some hymns, son. You'll be yes. able to reach more people because... God speaks to us through his hymns sometimes, doesn't he? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that is so important. One of the dangers, Dr. Davis, that we're in, uh, I'm a third generation AME. Mm -hmm. uh, my father's a bishop in the AME church. My grandfather was. And uh, one of the things that is dangerous in my grandfather's age and in my father's time, uh, there were clear, distinctive denominational lines. Mm -hmm. So you knew where the AMEs were, where the Baptists were, where the Pentecostals, the Apostolic Church of God in Christ. And while it is that we were divided, it, here's what was distinctively different. We knew why we were. Mm. Uh, now that we've come to the disintegration of denominations and we're just one happy campfire, is that we no longer know what we believe. Mm. Uh, and as a consequence, we are now drawn to personalities and not principles. Uh, and so we're living in a culture where people identify the church by the pastor mm. and not the institution. Mm. Uh, and so you've got people that say, I go to Frank Reed's church, I go to Jamal Bryant's church, I go to Bishop Jakes's church, mm -hmm. uh, but God says, upon Paul. this rock, uh -huh. I'll build my church. I'm a and so Paulist. what is very important is that while we're moving into a new millennia of ministry, yes. is that we've got to go back to foundation. We used to have catechism class, and we used to understand what it is that we believe, and now we're raising a generation of of illiterate, degenerate believers, mm -hmm. uh, of young people who don't know the Apostles' Creed, don't know the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. and after John 3.16, they're done. Uh, and so at some point, we got to stop turning our neighbor and turn to the Bible That's right. uh, and say, this is where it is that we are and how it is that we process. Amen. Amen. Oh, that is so valuable, so true. And, and people get lost along the way. Yes, I, I'm sort of non-denominational, but yes. I know what I believe. Right, right. I believe much of, of, of several denominations, right. but it's all Bible-based. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and if you just trust God and, and study yes. to show yourself approved unto yes. God, a workman yes. that yes. needed not be ashamed rightly, dividing the word of truth, you'll be all right. Yes. But look for the guidance that always returns to Scripture. Absolutely. And, uh, and interprets it wisely. One of the things that we have to be intentional about is we have a lot of charismatic personalities mm -hmm. who have inspiration but don't have information. 
Uh, and so the people are shouted up, but they're not built up. Yeah. Uh, and so there's got to be something that doesn't just make me feel warm and fuzzy on Sunday, mm -hmm. but practical principles that I can apply Monday through Saturday. That's right. That's I need right. to know more than ain't he all right and won't he do it. <laughs> uh, I need to know how can I do it and will I be all right. Uh -huh. uh, and so <laughs> yeah. if we're able to turn that corner and raise the standard and challenge our pastors uh, to progressively be readers, to investigate what other people are doing for effective ministry, to stop uh -huh. hateration and learn how to celebrate mm -hmm. other ministries that are doing well. I think that the oil is true. It starts from the head mm -hmm. and flows down. And if the pastor's not learning and growing and evolving, then the church is always going to be stagnant. Enter to worship, depart to, to serve. serve. Absolutely. You're a good AME. We're going to take you in. I ain't mad at him. You know, in the last four years, I think I probably preached at as many AME as Baptist churches. It's wonderful. And others, too. Yes. But God is good. And, and, and it's true. What you say is very true. If we're not teaching disciples, uh, uh, developing disciples, yes. then, then when they leave on Sunday after church, where are they going to exhibit whatever they've learned where yes. are they going to show that they are servants of a living god yes. and 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 folks need to see the love of god expressed through through all of those who believe yes absolutely so uh i think you you really uh, you're really on to something there it's very important but but even more so you got a sermon for us. Yes. And just between you, me, the lamppost, and about four million people, yeah. I want to hear what you got to say. All right. All right. Will you preach the word I'd for us? I'd be so honored. Dr. Absolutely. Jamal Harrison Bryan, everybody. So Gonna break the middle lane. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it is amazing how God can turn agony into his glory is often only on the other side of a tragedy that we find how much God can find triumph in our own natural is where God exhibits and exudes the excellence of supernatural who wasn't that long ago here in the United States that one of our singing icons uh, Whitney Houston found herself in a premature uh, death state it should have been a season nationally of wailing but in spite of that, it became three and a half hours of uninterrupted worship uh, that God called the entire nation into a season of giving God the glory. What a wonderful testament. And while it is that some 13 million viewers from around the world sat on the edge of their seat and heard the soulful singing of Alicia Keys and Donnie McClurkin and the Winans family and the inspirational messages of Bishop uh, T.D. Jakes and Bishop Marvin Winans, one of the central moments of reflection that really jumped out and resonated with me was when Kevin Costner shared his remarks. And he, he said something very critical that I really feel impressed upon uh, to share with you on the night. As when he came to the stage, he said that when he got the script uh, for the bodyguard, he said that there was nobody else who was born for this role but Whitney Houston. He took that recommendation to the writers and to the production company in Beverly Hills and said, I want Whitney Houston to play this role. They had a lot of skepticism because she had no experience, had never been in front of a silver screen. But he said, it doesn't matter. She's still built for the role. And I'm here to say something to somebody who's watching around the world, whether you're in Canada, California, or Cambodia, or the Caribbean, your next assignment, you have no experience in. Uh, what, what God is getting ready to do for you, what you are getting ready to do, you have never done in your life. Uh, they sought out Whitney Houston's manager, and when they sought out Whitney Houston's manager, they said, unfortunately, she's gone on tour for the next year. He said, it doesn't matter because she's built for the role, we'll wait a year. And I, I want to say to somebody, whatever you were supposed to get, it was ready for you in 2011. But God had to wait for you to get some other stuff together. But this is the year. 
everything you've been training for, everything you've been preparing for is getting ready to come to pass. A critical thing happened, ladies and gentlemen, is that when she flew into Los Angeles from Newark, New Jersey, Kevin Costner went into her trailer and said to her, in no uncertain terms, you are ready for this position. She said, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I have what it takes. She was the biggest singing icon in all of the world, not just America, all of the world, having garnered some 244 awards. And she was still unsure of herself, yeah. unsure of her gift, yeah. unsure of her assignment. Yeah. And he said to her something very critical that God has dispatched me to say to you tonight, yeah. you are good enough. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what you've been through in your life. It doesn't matter what all your negatives are. You are good enough. And I want you to please tonight be your own life coach. Look yourself in the mirror and say it doesn't matter what other people think about me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am good enough. And he said to Whitney Houston, he said you're absolutely good enough. And Whitney Houston said something very critical. Can you just give me 20 minutes? And Kevin Costner left out of the trail and waited for her in the room in which she was going to have the screen tests. But what she did not know, ladies and gentlemen, is that the results were already rigged. She already had the position. The producer just wanted to see, here it is, how she would handle the tests. How she would keep her countenance, how she would keep her focus while other people were watching. And I am here to tell somebody, the storm you're in is just your screen test. God, God wants to see, how are you going to give me glory while other people are watching? Other people know you're broke, they know you're unemployed, they know you're a single parent, they know you've been to jail, but you got to say, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Whitney Houston didn't even know the position was already rigged. Kevin Costner said she could have fallen, could have hurt, her, hurt herself, but she was still going to get the position. And that's good news for somebody who's watching that in spite of the times that you've fallen, in spite of the time that you've fallen short of the glory, in spite of the time that you have measured up, you are not disqualified from your position because what God has for you, it is for you. He said to her, Whitney did said to Kevin Costner, can you just give me 20 minutes? Uh -huh. He said, you can have 20 minutes. I'm waiting for you in the green room where the audition is going to take place. Okay. Whitney Houston alighted from the trail and came into the green room for the audition. And within one minute, he shut the lights off escorted her out of the auditioning green room, took her back to the trailer and asked her a critical question. What did you do? And she responded with a sly grin on her face and said, nothing. Says, I want to ask you again, in those 20 minutes that I left you, what did you do? She said, I did absolutely nothing. He took his hands and turned Whitney Houston's shoulders around and made her face herself in the mirror. And she saw that all of the makeup was running down her face. Because, ladies and gentlemen, she took off what the producer put on her. And she put on, watch this, what she was used to using from her past. She thought the makeup from the videos would be strong enough for the movie. But the producer was putting her on a different stage. So the stuff she used in her past was not strong enough for what she was using in her future. The lights were too bright and could not handle it. I am here to tell you, throw away the stuff from your past. It is not good enough for where it is you're getting ready to go. It can't handle the pressure, it cannot handle the intensity, and it cannot handle the stage. Says I'm bringing production back in, I'm putting the fresh coat of makeup back on you, and I need to ask you, Kevin Costner said to Whitney Houston, which is my responsibility to reverberate to you tonight, do you trust me? And with tears down her face, she said, yes, I trust you. He said, Whitney, if you don't remember anything else, you are good enough. And he allowed her to, in fact, be able to take that role and catapult her into a whole nother stratosphere. Ladies and gentlemen, in Song of Solomon, chapter 4, Solomon is getting ready to, in fact, consummate the marriage with his new bride.
and she's nervous and feeling anxious because this is her first time she's ever been with the thing she has been promised she has been expecting it but now it's right with her and he's trying to assuage her nerves and calm her down and settle her spirits and says to her in Song of Solomon chapter 4 verse number 1 clause A you are beautiful and then he repeats it again and says you are beautiful for any theologues in the room you understand that whenever it is that we cross pollinate the text and go into the New Testament whenever Jesus repeats himself he is adding extra emphasis surely surely truly truly verily verily so when Song of Solomon is saying to his bride you are beautiful you are beautiful he's saying I'm not just talking I mean this thing and I want to say to somebody who's watching whether you are in fact in a place where you're fighting through the spirit of low self-esteem or self-sabotaging behavior God has assigned me to come into your room and to tell you you are beautiful you are fearfully and you are wonderfully made that you are the head and not the tail if nobody else has ever told you you the best looking you you ever been there is nobody that can get in the ring with you because you are absolutely beautiful you'll notice in Song of Solomon chapter 4 he says that you have the eyes of a dove and ladies I don't know whether you can accept this compliment for a man to tell you you got bird's eyes uh, but you have to understand something about a dove ladies and gentlemen is that a dove's eyes hear me cannot move uh, they can only focus on one thing at a time and I'm here for somebody who is single and watching God told me to tell you who he's gonna bring you is gonna have dove's eyes because they will not have a wandering eye when they understand who you are they're just gonna focus on you and say this is the best I could ever get and I'm glad to have somebody this beautiful something strategic about a dove's eye is because when you go back to Genesis chapter 6 there was a man by the name of Noah who was in fact in the middle of a flood and he opened up a window and when he opened up a window first he sent out a raven but the raven never returned so he opened back up the window some days later and released a dove but when the dove came back he came back with an olive branch in his mouth because why the dove could see further than what the raven could I am here preaching specifically to people around the world who have a dove's eye. You see beyond your storm. You see beyond your circumstance. And while other people think you're going to drown in your mess, God is telling you the storm you just came out of is the worst it's ever going to be. But when you come out of this, things are going to be better than it's ever been in your life. And Song of Solomon chapter 2, chapter 4, verse number 2, he says, you have the hair of a goat from Mount Gilead. No, nobody wants the hair of a goat. It's matted, it's strong, it's, it's hard to comb in the process. But the reason why he tells her she's got the hair of a goat, but specifically from Mount Gilead, is because in all of the Judean hills, there's some 200, Mount Gilead is the only hill where hunters are not allowed, where poachers cannot in fact graze. They can look at you, but they cannot take aim at you. God told me to tell those of you who have been in a season of consecration. I have put you in a hedge fence of protection. The enemy can see you, but he cannot touch you because there is in fact something on your life that no weapon that is formed against you shall be able to prosper. You ought to thank God because there were some people who wanted to get close to you, but God said, touch not my anointed and do my servant no harm. There was something significant and something strategic that he is in fact saying in this hour that we've got to in fact get ourselves girded up to understand what God is getting ready to do is a critical place. Because notice this ladies and gentlemen, Solomon tells his betrothed wife, you are beautiful, watch this, while the veil is still on her. He couldn't even see all of who she was. All he could do was make out a shadow and image. And I want you to understand this is the year people are gonna owe you an apology because they can't even see all of who you are 
but just the curve of your greatness, just the mirror of your excellence is so profound that when God lifts the veil and people see how anointed you really are, they gonna have to back up and say, what manner of man, what manner of woman is this that you're able to walk with such grace even when you had a veil on you? He says something strategic says something strategic Solomon does in chapter 4 I'm now in verse number 6 he says come up to the mountain come up to the mountain and there you will in fact notice that the atmosphere has changed you'll notice that the oxygen is at a different level because when we come up now to the mountain you will now start inhaling frankincense and myrrh you'll notice whenever God sends you somebody the sign that God sends you somebody is you can't stay on the same level is that when he realized he had a gift he said let's go to the mountain if in fact it is in fact somebody dispatched from God they ought to be in the words of Beyonce able to upgrade you if they can't upgrade you it's not from God it says come on up to the mountain here it is come up to the mountain and smell the aroma of Frank sense in myrrh the next time ladies and gentlemen we find both of these ingredients together is when Jesus is born is that the wise men come into that stinky stable and that manger and present him with the gifts of frankincense and myrrh they are in fact the sign of what worship is supposed to be like because in Revelation it says that your worship is like a fresh fragrance in the nostril of God when it is that you worship please hear me very clearly when you worship with a pure heart you change atmospheres when you worship God situations cannot remain the same when you worship God things will be absolutely different in the verse number seven I gotta go seven is the number of completion in verse number seven Song of Solomon chapter four watch how it is that Solomon brings the rejoinder clause of this verse he now repeats what he says in verse number one he says you are beautiful you are beautiful. But now, ladies and gentlemen around the world, he adds an addendum in verse 7 that he didn't say in verse number 1. He says, you have no blemishes. Please hear me clearly. In other words, in verse 1, she had blemishes. He just didn't mention it. But now that she's gone to a higher level, she didn't even understand while she was worshiping, the blemishes came off of her. And I came to tell somebody, whether you're in a military barrack, a college dorm, an apartment, or a hotel, if you worship God right now, your blemishes are coming off. If you give him glory, every stain, every scar, every issue, every disease is coming off of you. And I don't know whether you realize it or not, but I only wanted to tell you one thing, you're good enough. And if you give God glory right now, everything that has stained your life, everything that has caused a scar, everything that has messed you up is coming off of you. You are good enough. You are good enough to open up that business. You are good enough to start that church. You are good enough to be a successful single parent. You are good enough to go to the front of the line. You are good enough to defeat every demon. You are good enough to break every generational curse. You are good enough. Give God glory for the great things. Hallelujah. Bless you, sir. Bless you, sir. Wonderful. Bless you, sir. Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, if you ever thought you are not good enough, we've got news for you tonight. You are good enough. Um, so, some people may have told you you weren't good enough, but, but I want you to see Christ kneeling in the garden, preparing 
for his crucifixion. And, and I want you to see the tears in his eyes as he asked his father to, that if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, he said that because you're good enough. And so I want you to see them press the crown of thorns on his head and drag him away. Hey, he only did that because you were good enough. And then they hung him on a tree and pierced his hands and and he only did that because you were good enough. That's good. And he hung his head and he didn't. And he died because you were good enough. And then early Sunday morning, he got up out that grave because you were good enough. And one day soon, he's coming back again because you are good enough. If you accept Christ in your life today, if you say yes, Lord, to Jesus, if you say yes, Lord, I will follow you.